We're going to go on now uh, to Autolith Labs and Sam Owen. I'd like you to meet Claire. She's a research audiologist who developed a vestibular disorder called Meniere's disease. When she gives a lecture, her tinnitus is so loud, she has to ask the front row if she's speaking too loud or soft. And every morning, she has to sit in bed for 45 minutes waiting for her vertigo to subside before she can walk safely. Claire's story is typical for those living with vertigo. 70% miss work and nearly 6% have to leave their job because of it. Claire isn't alone either. In the US, 16 million people develop vertigo every year. This results in 4.4 million visits to emergency care centers. Vertigo creates over $10 billion in medical costs from emergency care visits alone. But the kicker to all this is no existing standard of care for vertigo exists. Put simply, an ER doctor would rather see a broken bone than a vertigo patient because at least they'd know they can make it better. One prominent ER doctor put it this way. If there was a fast acting solution for vertigo, it would be revolutionary, not evolutionary. My name is Sam Owen. I'm the founder of Odolith Labs, and I'm gonna tell you about something revolutionary. Vertigo is primarily a symptom of a condition related to the vestibular system. The vestibular system is essentially a motion sensor that's inside your inner ear. What Odolith has developed is a small bone conduction system about the size of eight quarters stacked that sends an inaudible vibration to stimulate the vestibular system in a constant but non-informative way. Think of it like a white noise machine. For instance, if you're laying in bed trying to sleep, but noise from traffic, dogs barking, or people talking is keeping you up, you can turn on a fan. That fan produces a white noise that allows you to naturally tune out those disruptive sounds and lets you sleep. Now to be clear, your ears still work fine. Your brain has simply de-emphasized the sensory input because it's constant and non-informative. That's exactly what Otolith technology does, but for the vestibular system. And it works incredibly well at managing vertigo. We've been able to attract interest from multiple researchers hoping to try our technology on their patients, including doctors from Jefferson University, the University of Maryland, and the University of Miami. These studies, along with our own internal studies, have had amazing results. Here's some of the feedback that we've received. I felt the dizziness start to creep back. Just popped it on again and was fine seconds later. I don't like being without it. I'm wearing it every day. It's given me the ability to drive again. I have been using the Odolith device and I've found significant relief to the extent that I've been able to return to work. Frankly, it was hard to send it back, but I did. My vertigo was considerably better. I have one patient right now that is suffering from vestibular migraines. The device has been a huge game changer for her. And how fast does it work? Instantly, it's like flicking a switch. Immediate, long-lasting relief without side effects that has a meaningful impact on people's lives. That's what we're developing here at Otolith. Today, our technology is reliable, robust, and designed for clinical trials. But by the end of next year, we plan to have a consumer-ready design which will submit along with our clinical data for FDA approval. In the future, our compact technology could be integrated with headphones, hats, and more inconspicuous wearables. It could communicate with other sensors and wearables as part of a smart device platform and come on automatically as needed. And in the future, we could offer a low-cost device with electronic refill to make the technology more widely affordable. But Odolith technology has users beyond just those with debilitating vertigo. Motion sickness is also vestibular related. For instance, if you're reading in a car, your eyes say that you're stationary, but your inner ear says that you're moving. This causes a sensory mismatch, which results in spatial discordance. Your brain, sensing something is off, believes that you have ingested a poison and you end up with nausea. Now, unlike vertigo, there are options for motion sickness. However, regardless of whether it's Dramamine or those wristbands, they all try to address the symptom of nausea. Otolith intervenes much earlier in the process by addressing the vestibular system and preventing the spatial discordance. It is the only solution that prevents the cause, not just the symptoms. The result is it works immediately, lasts indefinitely, and because it's just white noise, has no side effects or impact on vestibular function. The benefits go beyond car sickness. The same spatial discordance is behind air sickness, sea sickness, virtual reality sickness, and of course, 
space sickness. You may recognize Bob and Doug, our astronauts who recently returned from space. Here they are describing what they expect to happen. Um, I'm expecting um, a little bit of uh, a little bit of vomiting maybe to happen in the yeah. end game. So when we yeah. get to that opportunity to do that in the water together, it's kind of a weird thing to say, but that's the, I'm looking for that kind of celebratory uh, event. Motion sickness takes place at every step of space travel. From the costly inability to work when first arriving in space to the dangers of severe motion sickness during a water landing. Motion sickness is such a big problem for NASA, they actually have a written Human Research Roadmap Gap, SM27, searching for a new non-pharmaceutical intervention for motion sickness to reduce astronaut dependence on drugs and avoid their harmful side effects. Well, here it is. And you know what? NASA isn't alone. The U.S. Air Force recently awarded Otolith with a $1.5 million Phase II Sivir to integrate our technology into pilot training helmets for the AETC. The goal being less trainee dropout due to motion sickness, which accounts for over $1 million in sunk costs for every trainee and the Defense Health Agency is looking for a portable vestibular stimulator to reduce vertigo due to vestibular dysfunction, which occurs in one quarter of Iraq and Afghanistan war veterans. Well, I couldn't describe what we're doing any better than that, which is why we were awarded a $250,000 Phase 1 sever and have submitted a proposal for the Phase 2. Of course, motion sickness prevention has commercial applications as well. Car companies are all gearing up for the introduction of self-driving vehicles. The problem, of course, is a lot of people don't want to be a passenger when they get motion sick, and nobody wants to pop a pill for a 20-minute ride when it leaves them drowsy for the rest of the day. Well, we can help here, too. Both Jaguar, Land Rover, and Ford have conducted placebo-controlled studies on our technology and found that those with our technology lasted significantly longer and developed significantly less motion sickness symptoms when wearing our device as compared to wearing a placebo device or when they wore no device. And VR Motion, a small business and military contractor that develops driver training simulators using virtual reality, saw their dropout rate plummet from 20 to 30 percent to below 1 percent when they began using our technology in their demonstrations. Clearly, we have a technology that can be applied to multiple markets. There's the medical market, which is by far the largest market in terms of dollars spent, poses the least competition, and addresses the biggest pain point. We are building ourselves as a standalone company, but have begun reaching out to larger players in the ENT space to consider potential partnerships or acquisition. There's the military market, which has provided us with early revenue and demonstrates market need. Additionally, custom military integrations could preserve the price point of a medical device while providing significant revenue in the long run through sole source contracts. There's the automotive market, which has demonstrated efficacy of our technology through free clinical studies and may draw interest from their venture groups. And finally, there's the VR market, which is fast growing but has significant adoption issues due to motion sickness. Our technology can be easily integrated with VR headsets, and because it will be part of a larger system without medical claims, we won't even need to wait for the FDA approval for it to be sold with the VR systems. Now, being a small company, it's crucial that we stay focused, which is why for now, we are focusing on the medical market because of its size and pain point, and the military market to provide us with early R&D funding. Our market path will start with going through the FDA. Since our technology is the first of its kind, we'll go through the de novo process as the first fast acting treatment for the management of vertigo. We anticipate submitting to the FDA in early 2022. This path will ensure that we receive a unique HICSPIX code, which will result in significantly higher reimbursement rates down the road than devices which simply manage nausea. Of course, reimbursement will take some time, and we imagine our first users will need to pay for our device out of pocket. We've identified ENT offices as the best initial market entry point, as ENT doctors already have the existing infrastructure to sell their patients hearing aids out of pocket. will simply be another product that they can offer their patients at a similar price point. So let's talk about market size. It's huge. The emergency departments see 4.4 million patients a year for vertigo, and there are 16 million incidences a year just in the US. With even minor penetration of the market, Odal's technology could result in over $1.6 billion in revenue. Now, before we get there, we're looking at the DOD and other government agencies for early revenue. So far, we've received $1.8 million in government contracts. 
Looking forward, this year we're in the process of applying for or awaiting on feedback from over $4 million in additional funding. As a company, we're focused on answering two basic questions. Does it work and will people buy it? For motion sickness, the first question has already been answered. Yes, absolutely. But we currently have a telemedicine study enrolling along with our university studies to answer this for vertigo. The data so far has pointed towards yes, helping the majority of people with vertigo. We plan to take what we learned from these pilot studies and apply them to a pivotal study starting next year in anticipation of our FDA submission in early 2022. Regarding will people buy it, we're of course receiving market validation from the military, but more importantly, our telemedicine study currently underway has demonstrated how desperate these people are for anything based on the number of signups we've received even before we started advertising. We may also test a limited market release in a foreign market to further understand price point once we have an FDA ready device. Of course, we'll need funding to do all this, which is why we plan to raise our Series A beginning this fall and continuing into winter to take us through FDA approval and plan to raise our Series B to fund our launch into the US market. Now, no medical device deck would be complete without an IP slide, and we've been awarded two strong method and utility patents. First, in order to create the vibration we needed within an inch of the ear, we had to develop what is quite possibly the world's quietest vibrator while simultaneously being as powerful as a vibrator nearly 15 times as massive. But more importantly, we were able to quantitatively define the power and frequency levels of the vibration needed. Even if someone can invent another quiet vibrator, they can't do what we're doing without being a placebo, being dangerous, or infringing on our patents. We have a strong technical team that includes inner ear experts who have spent 25 years at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, product designers who have brought over 20 hardware products to market, and a couple of business development gurus who spent the last 20 years working with startups after leaving their executive positions at AOL. As a company snapshot, we've been awarded $1.8 million in government contracts, and we've been able to raise $2.4 million from angel investors. And these aren't just friends, families, and fools. Our investors include the founders of K2M, which was recently purchased by Stryker for $1.4 billion, the founders of Harpoon Medical, and four ENTs who have seen the effect of our technology on their patients. At the beginning of September, we had $621,000 in cash and were cash neutral through November as we execute on our awarded contracts. What we're looking for now are medical device investors to speak with as we prepare for our Series A round. We anticipate raising 10 to $15 million, which will fund the company through FDA approval. We're also looking for introductions to medical device companies in the ENT space, especially if it's a company that missed the now saturated hearing aid market and doesn't want to miss the next big thing in otolaryngology, such as Fuji or Olympus. Also, we're looking for introductions at the highest levels of VR companies or Facebook. I hear Sheryl Sandberg, the COO of Facebook, gets VR sickness. While we are trying to stay focused on medical, if there is the opportunity to quickly monetize a non-core market like VR through licensing or partial acquisition and simultaneously solve one of the VR industry's biggest problems, we'd like to speak with someone who can make decisions. Finally, as I mentioned, we are currently enrolling subjects in a telemedicine study to further investigate the efficacy of our technology on vertigo. If you know someone who has frequent attacks, please forward our information along to them. And if they're not able to participate in this one, we anticipate having several follow-on studies and we'll always reach out to those in our database first. So in summary, Odolth has developed the first therapeutic to treat a large unaddressed market. Our technology has been proven effective and has a low risk profile. We have an experienced team that can bring a product to market. And most importantly, we address a written NASA technology gap. Immediate, long-lasting relief without any side effects. Let me show you what that looks like. And then instantly, and I feel like I can actually have some intelligibility in speech. That is amazing. <laughs> All right, thank you. Let's open it up for questions. Chairman, go ahead. <laughs> Hey, how are you doing? Um, do you plan on getting uh, 510K or going after 510K or PMA? Yeah, so we will have to do the de novo 510K. So we have to create the classification and then we'll go through the 510K route. We'll be a class two medical device. 
Raja, how many people do you think you need in your trial? Have you developed, have you gotten a clinical trial specialist yet or no? Yeah, so we're working with a uh, clinical trial uh, specialist who's helping us get through the FDA. Um, for motion sickness, the uh, power study showed around uh, 100 people being necessary in the pivotal trial. Uh, the improvement we're seeing in vertigo will probably indicate that it's going to be about the same. Um, given its low risk nature, it's it, a lot of the things aren't. Um, it, it probably won't have to be especially, you know, huge or anything like that. All right. Thank you, Ramona. Yes. Um, do you need to wear this on both sides of your head, or a single side is sufficient? So we had started a study before COVID to look at both sides, but single side seems to work. Um, we, we want to an answer that question of does uh, applying it in both sides make a difference? Um, unfortunately, that study got shut down due to COVID. But what I can say is the level of vibration that we use is low enough that the, um, the skull essentially looks like a single object and it penetrates both sides of it. So there may be improvement, but it's not necessary. And I just want to share a, an observation. Imagine, uh, just wondering if you folks have thought about this. In some concepts, this seems uh, similar, one thing only conceptual, because it's electrical versus yours is vibration, to a TENS unit, a transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation device, which I've had notable experience using. Have you ever? talked about or uh, the, the similarities and how that works in disrupting signals. Everything's taking place normally, but uh, the pain uh, in a TENS unit or the vestibular disturbance is gone. You know, I've got my uh, chief science officer on here. He probably knows more about what's in the literature. Didi, you want to ask, answer this? Yes. Uh, so our device is much more unobtrusive than a TENS device. It is just vibrations. You don't need any gel or anything for application. This being said, it's something that I would like to do. It's uh, compare TENS to our device and measure the efficacy. I just wanted to add just one thing about unilateral versus bilateral. We have done a study on cadavers by having uh, optical fibers placed in the cock, in the inner ear, of several cadavers. And we find that at the frequencies that we use, which are very, very specific, the skull acts as a single body and so at least from the cadaver point of view it doesn't seem like unilateral versus bilateral matters much okay thank you any other questions yeah i have a quick uh, quick question um is it uh the device is does everybody need the same frequency or does the frequency vary by person and so for instance if you put this in a car would it be just a device that anybody in the car could use, or would it be that it need to be tuned to a patient? So, uh, first answer is frequency is not important. Uh, so, that was one of the graphs that I showed in our IP slide is that if you have the right power level, frequency is not that important. However, frequency is important for safety. So, if, you, if it's too low, it, uh, you can actually feel the distractive tappings. If you go too high, you actually risk hearing loss. So at the frequency we picked, it's essentially inaudible. But if you go too high in frequency, you could actually cause hearing damage. Um, for power, uh, which is really the question that you're getting at, is, is it one size fit all, fits all? Um, we have a very large range that's in our IP. Uh, we have found that depending on the vestibular disorder, uh, there is some variability. However, with healthy vestibular systems, uh, with motion sickness, uh, you can have essentially a one size fits all. You could add in variability just for personal comfort, but essentially it's one size fits all for motion sickness. So, so this is Dal this is Dallas. Um, as someone who woke up with severe severe vertigo, in my opinion, um, out of the blue, uh, this device sounds like something that would really have. Um, quickly dissipated the process of healing. It took uh, three to four months to get rid of it. Is that is that a true assessment? No, it's not. Uh, so we are symptom management and only symptom management. When you put on our device, it masks the vestibular system and it relieves the symptom of vertigo. It does not address the underlying cause. It does not help you heal faster. Um, it is completely symptom management. 
However, if you just need to get back to work, if you need to go from severe vertigo to moderate vertigo so that you can now walk and, you know, do stuff, that is what our technology does. I could not walk. I could not get out of bed. Basically, I could I was falling off the floor. So this would solve that problem. It would not solve the, the healing process. That's right. It, it, it would probably still take the same amount of time for you to heal. But uh, if you needed a fast act, it's, it's like taking a Tylenol. Tylenol is not going to solve the root cause of the pain. But you know what? The pain's gone. You can now function. That's great. That's great. Uh, hey, Sam, Rich Godwin here. Uh, nice to see you again. Good to see you. Um, one of the things I was wondering about in terms of, this, of the space program and with NASA's requirements is that space sickness is not always, um, it, it's mainly caused by motion, but it's not always caused by motion. Sometimes it's caused by spatial disconnect where you're going from one room to another where you think you're on the ceiling and then all of a sudden you're on the other side of the ceiling and you think that should be the floor and then you look around and your brain suddenly goes, whoa. Uh, so your eyes are telling your vestibular system something is seriously wrong here. Is that still part and parcel of what your device can fix because of that? Yeah, I mean, so if you remember the, the, the slide that I had that kind of showed the process of what causes motion sickness that you know, we're not going after nausea. We're going after the spatial discordance, and that is what we solve. Um, we have not tested in space yet, but the biggest, the closest analogy we've heard when speaking with, uh, with NASA scientists is that virtual reality is probably the most analogous um, because it's, it's a visual um, induced spatial discordance rather than a vestibular stimulation spatial discordance. And with virtual reality, we're incredibly uh, effective, even more so than car sickness. One, one more question. Can you uh, tell us about uh, the form factor? Uh, is this something you can miniaturize further? A absolutely. So uh, this size right here, so about the size of eight quarters stack, right now is about the smallest we can get our technology. Uh, we do have a new design that we're working on that's uh, incrementally smaller than this, but it can't get too much smaller than this. Uh, right now, we built it into some relatively unattractive device, but it works. And this is for clinical trials. However, going forward, what we're planning on doing is kind of having a pod-like design. So you can imagine something like this. It can clip into a hat. It can clip into a headband. It can clip into, you know, just about anything. And uh, this could be a very versatile product that you just have aftermarket products that it goes into. All right, we have so a question for you. I have a quick question for you, Sam. Great product. Uh, really excited about this and the applications for NASA, of course, and uh, defense. Is this, do you see any roadblocks be able to use this in space and zero G and also any challenges for your target? Defense are the pilot examples where they they have a helmet. There's a lot of vibration and other noise and other distractions. Um, what are the challenges for those two application areas? Sure, I'll talk about the pilot one. Uh, so ambient vibration is great. So if you're in a quiet room with no nothing, you will actually you know hear a little bit. You'll you'll feel it a little bit. But if you're in a car, for instance, that's driving, there's an ambient vibration. You do not notice it at all. And so it becomes incredibly undistracting. So that's actually a positive, having all those uh, good things. The issue that we ran into with, um, with the helmet integration is not an insurmountable one, but right now our technology is completely inaudible. The moment, uh, well, I don't have one on me, but the moment you put it in an ear cup or you've now put it inside a resonator, mm -hmm. you suddenly mm -hmm. introduce sound again. So we're trying to work out how can we keep this you know, inaudible. Uh, but that's about it. Uh, with, with space, the big issue is power consumption. Um, this little battery right here lasts for 18 mm -hmm. hours. It works on less than one-tenth of a watt. So low voltage, low power consumption. It's incredibly efficient. Excellent. Thank you, Sam. Looking forward to talking to you guys later. Looking forward to it as well. This is Dallas again. How, how long are you uh, taking applicants for your clinical trials? Uh, so the, the, the current trial is a 40-person uh, study, and we have 30 through it already. 
Um, that being said, we are, this is a pilot study. We are using this to inform our pivotal study, which will launch next year. And we plan to do it through a telemedicine way, just because all of our clinical studies at these universities have all been shut down because it's no longer essential. So we will be taking people for the next year at least. And there are online applications at your website? Yeah, yeah. If you, if you go to just otolith.com or otolithlabs.com, you can find it. Uh, again, if you can't get in with this particular study because it's going to close relatively soon, we're going to pull from people who are in our database first and just say, hey, if you still have this problem, we launched a new study. Would you like to join? Thank you. You had a, uh, in one of your slides that you were looking at chemotherapy. Um, can you explain how that, that works for, for your device? Sorry, what was the question one more time? You, you, on one of your slides, you said you had funding from NIH on chemotherapy, and I thought that was a uh, chemical induced nausea. So I wondered how your device works on that. Uh, Diddy, you want to take this one? Mate, yeah. Um, so this is uh, a bit of a mystery as to why it would work. Uh, it was, um, I mean, it's going to involve 5-HT receptors that are involved in the vomiting associated with chemotherapy, but uh, it would take me half an hour to present a, uh, the sort of hypothesis we have as to why it works. What we do know is that our device was used in four people at Drexel University Oncology before it shut down, and all four patients had vomited so much during the first round of chemo, this platin, that they had to be readmitted for rehydration and care which delayed their second round of chemo. And so during the second round of chemo, all four patients wore the device and only one patient threw up only once. And so uh, we had a promising start until uh, unfortunately Hahnemann and Drexel got sold and shut down part of their operation. Does it work, just that, just Would it work for morning sickness? Uh, this, I've been hesit hesitating on that because once you get into a pregnancy and things, uh, liability insurance might be a little too high for us. Uh, so I would like to know the answer to that. Uh, there's only so much we can do and uh, we have to choose. And, uh, and I do want to just add briefly, so in our study we have enrolled some people who have medication-induced vertigo and our technology has worked incredibly well. Okay. Real quick question, what about motion sickness? Uh, so, Motion sickness works incredibly well. That was the first thing that we tested because it's so okay, easy sorry, to in induce. And um, we had an independent study conducted and has been published by Jaguar Land Rover. It was conducted independently of us. And another study, which is not published yet, but was also very positive, conducted also independently of us by Ford. The only thing we did was just to provide them with the devices and instruction for use. Excellent. Right. Thank you. Last question, Kurt. A uh, real couple of real quick questions. First, uh, have you looked at intermittent use of this instead of continuous use as a power saving uh, approach? Uh, you know, if, if you want to have your battery last longer than I, I forgot how long you said, but it does intermittent application work? Um, at this point, it, it not so much. Uh, like we, we haven't done some we haven't done enough studies on this. What we have seen anecdotally is basically you put it on, you turn it on, and there's an immediate reduction in symptoms. Um, you turn it off, symptoms come back. Uh, there is okay. some evidence, especially with motion sickness, that if you acclimate to kind of the, if, if you get used to tuning out your vestibular system, say if you've worn it for a couple of hours, you can turn it off and you don't immediately start paying attention to your vestibular system again. There, there does seem to be some lasting effect if you've had it on for a substantially long time. But eventually those, it does come back. But all that being said, it's less than a tenth of a watt. It doesn't take much to keep it going. Uh, you know, a single AA battery would essentially last for 20 hours. Okay, uh, thank you for that. And, and quick additional question. Uh, are you looking into incorporating that into like sound canceling headphones? Because it seems like, you know, like what I'm wearing uh, might might sort of make the whole thing easier to do. I, I just wondered if you've looked into that. 100%, it's in our patents. That's the obvious integration thing. It's just a much harder integration, um, you know, product design. So we're gonna start with something simple and then uh, expand into accessories. 
Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. That ends the Q&A. Uh, Max, back to you. Yeah, I was really excited about that one. I, I, I told them in some of the, the pre-work that I was excited to see if they could rename the NASA's vomit comment. As somebody who's been on there a couple of times, I can see, I, I, I see that there's a lot of misery that goes on that that plane. So if, if you guys can help out some uh, NASA engineers, maybe not even in space, but while they're doing some testing, I, I'm sure you'll 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 have some um, happy customers. Thank you so much for the work that you've done. And uh, getting to the top ten is an achievement uh, in itself. And all the work you guys have put in uh, is is uh, was really phenomenal. It was great to work with all of you. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, now, uh, as Tom said, uh, we are going to declare the winners, uh, and the winners will be receiving one of these beautiful NASA uh, iTech trophies uh, at some point in the near future. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Harry Park, Chief Technologist of Ames, and it's my pleasure to announce the winners today. i first like to thank all the judges. Um, the judging, I thought, was uh, we had a diverse set of opinions, and I really appreciate the um, the investor uh, and the external uh, input on, on the technologies. Um, all of the presenters were excellent. I thought the presentations at this time were incredible quality. All of the um, um, companies that's presented uh, received significant support for from at least some of the judges for for their for their technology and position. So it really was a very difficult job to to judge. Um, the judging period of time was was short. Um, uh, but anyway, so the final decision we we selected uh, uh, three companies, uh, a magnetic vision. Um, so so it's a virtual retina display. It has uh, potential applications for NASA, particularly using it in, in spacesuits uh, for displaying uh, uh, things that are of interest to us. Uh, could potentially lighten spacesuits because we don't need as many display, uh, particularly on curved structures. The second was from Mojo. It's a, um, um, Augmented reality. Uh, I really like their vision, a uh, uh, vision for a future where computing becomes invisible. I thought that vision, vision is that integration of, of the augmented reality and stuff into to our, our, our mission scenario has a lot of potential. And the third is Autolib. Um, they have a, a technology to, to treat the symptoms of vertigo. It is unique. Uh, for the NASA application, it is the treatment of motion sickness, and and it has applications to astronauts. But for commercial uh, space, for space tourism, uh, motion sickness is likely to be a significant issue, particularly if someone's only going up for a week. You don't want to spend a million or two million dollars and not be able to enjoy it. Uh, so this has a lot of potential in in for NASA. And I'd like to thank all of the presenters. I thought they were all excellent. Um, and I hope that we can follow up with all of you in the next uh, few months. Thank you very much. Sam? Yeah, hi. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm so humbled to have uh, been uh, named one of the winners considering the, the cohort that was here. Um, I, it's, it's just it's great to have been, even, you know, been in, among uh, those who competed with me. So. Uh, you know, first, thanks to everyone who did compete, because without you guys being in the competition, uh, you know, this really means something because of just how great the competition was. So I'm, I'm glad everyone is here to participate. And thank you so much to the, uh, the NASA people who really helped us formulate our story, um, kind of push us to make some material that we had let, uh, not done as far as like video and, and, and crafting that story. And um, of course, to everyone who helped Odalith to get where it's at, um, the Halcyon Incubator in Washington, D.C., uh, our technology would not exist without them, without Dr. Sachiko Kuno. Uh, taking a, a chance on someone who had a vague idea that if you interacted with the inner ear, you could prevent motion sickness and vertigo, 
uh, without any sort of research backing it up, without any sort of predicate research. She took a, a big risk on me. Um, I had mentors, I had uh, investors who all took a risk on me without any real trust other than thinking that um, this could be a, if, if this could solve something, it would be big. And so thank you to our investors. And then of course my co-founders who I would have never been able to get off the ground without. Um, uh, Tom Hardart, uh, Jack Daggett, DDA Depereau, and uh, John Akers, of course. Um, and then lastly, of course, to my wife who uh, has allowed me to go without a paycheck for a long time while I built my dream. And this is a great validation. And um, thank you so much. Congratulations to the whole, uh, to all the participants and, and especially to the winners. Before we uh, head out, I want to just uh, give a big thank you to the NIA team. Uh, you guys have done a great job. Um, this was my first event and, uh, and between the interactions that we had with the companies, but also uh, all of the facilitating that's been done, uh, all, of the, all of the work in the coaching and, uh, and quite frankly, you guys holding my hand through this as I learned it too. I really appreciate all of you guys. Uh, and this was a great experience for me. And I, th I think it's been a great experience for everybody. So thank you guys. Uh, I want to make sure that anybody who's watching the live stream right now, that you guys are aware that we have our cycle two event coming up on October 15th and 16th. So please join us for that, where we will have another round of 10 companies uh, showing us how their dual use technology can benefit NASA while still stimulating commercial markets. Thank you.